I'm Larry Gochi. I'm from the Flathead Indian Reservation, located in Pablo, Montana. I have a business which is located in Polson, Montana. And it's, uh, it's a business that has developed through the last 10 years to what it is today. And the business has uh, evolved from a, a small upholstery shop to a, a an umbrella company for uh, upholstery, teepee making, and custom embroidery. The, uh, the slide of the business in the beginning was to do upholstery and develop a showroom and have highway access with a shop. And as we purchased a piece of property, the local area has developed quite considerably. We now have a Walmart right across the street, a Burger King, a new bank, a bowling alley all within the last year. So to keep up with that property, uh, change in, in the traffic trends of the commercial businesses, we uh, started pursuing financing in the last year, two years, and uh, we built on a, we built an addition onto this shop from uh, 700 square feet to 3,000 to house these businesses. And uh, so today we're just getting ready to have a grand opening on our uh, combined business, which was be custom upholstery, Native American teepee and artwork, and custom canvas work. I started in business in 1972 in the Kentucky Fried Chicken. I owned two franchises and um, ended up over the last 25 years having eight restaurants. And there are a lot of work, there are a lot of money now, and today's standards, it's you're looking at uh, big dollars to uh, put a nice restaurant in and, and get it running and a lot of help, labor problems. But the reason I got into it was that uh, I sold the last one and had a no competition clause, so I had to regroup and find another business. And that was like 14 years ago, and I bought a, a small upholstery shop and found out that I could work with my hands and that I like I liked that kind of work. And uh, it was fun, but I wasn't making enough money because it was labor intense and that uh, you couldn't always depend on a year-round business. So I ended up having to take a full-time job to do that and then turn upholstery into a part-time, but all the time doing upholstery work. And as the business increased, or my reputation increased, and the clientele developed, then I started working less and we decided to find a shop for our own and build it, and, and that was like 10 years ago. I have a son that, that uh, was raised in the restaurant business, and as he was maturing, we bought the upholstery business. And when he got out of high school, he went to, call our, to a trade school and, and learned the upholstery business and, and uh, developed more skills than I was teaching him, because he picked up the auto trim so he decided he would come into it, so uh, my son then went and um, went away and worked for somebody else for a while until he developed his skill and got a little more expertise and I had room for him. And then we uh, opened a shop together about, I would say six years ago. And he worked with me in that shop and eventually uh, we split that shop off, and I moved up here to Polson in this location, and he has another full-time job in Missoula doing upholstery work, but he comes and helps me on a contract basis. Well, when my son was involved with me, 
we were looking at expansion. And at that time, I had just gone through a divorce. My credit rating was uh, probably low. We didn't have a lot of history in our upholstery business as a partnership. So we decided that we wanted to try to expand the business, but we didn't have a lot of natural credit and, uh, and a lot of the assets it would take to develop a shop and a business. And that, I think that would, that would have started about 1995. And in 1995, it, uh, it was an idea and a dream to find a commercial location and build a shop with a nice showroom and be able to do higher end and more professional type uh, work, do, do a, a more of a professional atmosphere. But like I said, we couldn't find the finance and we couldn't afford the land. So I took a full-time job at the tribe, and my son ran the upholstery shop. And the, the partnership worked well. We could be developed a, a nice clientele. We were busy. However, it wasn't what he, he was. My son was not able by himself to maintain that business. So I had purchased, I had been remarried, and purchased a piece of property here in Polson. That property uh, was rural when we bought it, and now it's commercial. And that's where we built our first shop. We remodeled a 24 by 30 garage into a upholstery shop. And at the same time, we started, while this was all happening, people were requesting that we uh, make Indian teepees or repair them. We started getting a lot of inquiries on buying canvas. So it started to look like there might be a market in the campus products or the TV business. So I took a class to college, Salish Kootenai College, on TV making. And also I took one from our Tribal Cultural Committee. And I also bought a book on TV making. So with a combination of all three, we built our first TV in the upholstery shop and sold it. And that year, I believe, we sold 25 teepees. So when we moved to this, when we closed the upholstery shop down and we moved up here, the intention was to do upholstery while the TP business was developing. And we did do that. We did upholstery along with, with uh, making teepees. But to, uh, one of the problems you run in when you make a teepee is that a teepee takes a lot of floor space and a lot of equipment that's not really related to the upholstery business. So as a result, we have a big yard, and that's where we were cutting our teepees out and painting them and marking them. And as we got busier and, and our, our need for more space to develop, it kind of blended together to be a, uh, with a commercial development alongside this, it developed there might be a paying prospect to go ahead and explore expanding the shop. And the shop, at that time, uh, was going to be just expanded to a 50 by 30 by 50 building, in which it ended up being that building plus two other additions to make 3,000 square feet. And as we're talking today, that's not enough already. In 1995, we approached the Salish Kootenai College Business Assistance Center with our ideas. My son and I were looking for a business plan looking for some way to approach this. Uh, we talked with Michelle Lansdowne, who was the director of the program, and she worked with us to try to get our ideas on paper, to develop a plan. And it's one of those cases where a matter of frustration on, on your own part because you want to do it now, but you can't because you don't have the ability. Uh, you're too busy to, to take the time to research everything you need to research. You don't have any idea where the local sources are because your bank uh, that you have been dealing with isn't interested because nobody buys teepees. And uh, so as a result, uh, the college was able to get us believing that we could do it. Uh, Michelle was able to uh, line out the paperwork that we needed to start thinking about it. It was a, a slow process. I think it took about 18 months or two years to even get the business plan done because of our workload, because of the indecision, because of waiting on people to make decisions. 
and it's a it's a long process. It, our dream was was there, but it wasn't really clear. We hadn't developed a, a solid goal, and and that's what the college did for us. It channeled that thought, and we could get a plan. And then once things started happening by the property values and the commercialism and all the other factors put into it, the goal became clearer. And then it was easier to approach bankers and write a plan. So finally in 1997, we got to a point where we were going to do it or we weren't. And uh, we were working with a, one of the counselors there and, and she was able to give us the encouragement through cheerleading and, and she had looked at it and she'd explored other options for us. And with her support and the, the development centers, business centers support, we were able to start pursuing a loan. The loan process, if, you, uh, if, if you're looking to, to, to uh, finance the building the way we were, with um, basically it was 100% financing. We had some equity in the property that we bought, but we needed creative financing. Conventional banks and SBA, were, we were rejected by both. And as a result, it was very discouraging. The, uh, the time it takes to, to do that and then be turned down and told that nobody likes TPs or wants TPs or, or you don't have the credit line or the credit ability, it was real discouraging. And through the, through the encouragement and, and by writing the proper business plans where we could get everything in line, it came to be where that uh, there were programs available. And one of them was the Native American Development Corporation had uh, a loan fund. Our local uh, tribal government had a holding company that was doing business loans. Plus, we had um, uh, business uh, personal notes that we were able to sign. We even used credit cards in the very beginning to finance our business. And, and that's a very expensive way to finance a business, but it was our only choice at the time. And we were able to, uh, through credit card, credit limits, able to get the first upholstery shop turned into the TP business and to uh, buy the equipment necessary to make TPs. Once, once the uh, loan process had started and we'd been approved through these different funds and, and, uh, and our creative financing that we had developed, the, the uh, idea was to go ahead and get the construction started and get going because we had approval. However, part of the money came through relatively fast, enough to get us in trouble if we would have stopped because we had, uh, had the property tore apart a lot of the supplies um, were ordered. We had locked in on contracts for building materials, which ended up saving us quite a bit of money because there was a couple price raises during this period. And uh, this all started in May and June. The actual financing was started then. And we got the first check right away. And that came through relatively clear. We got the building pretty much started. The second loan we got was a nightmare. And I believe we got our last check out of them in October. But what it did is it, it made the construction last our whole peak of our summer. So which we're on a tourist route and the busiest part of the year is the summer. That's where we sell most of our teepees and, and stuff. Well, we were under construction, people weren't stopping. The building wasn't ready to, to do the work in that we had sold. And everything was, we were shuffling around. And there's a lot of frustrations in trying to make do and keep a business going while you're doing it. And if we were, had a new startup business, it still would have been frustrating because the way the, the loan was written on the second loan, there were so many strings attached. The loan committee had personnel changes. The administration had a complete swap in people. No one really knew how to track this loan. We were educating people on all phases of it, on how we're going to do it. They wanted very restrictive uh, parts of this loan agreement and uh, try to, to comply with the, the loan agreement was an obstacle in itself. 
we, they weren't in a local one, it was out of town, so we were faxing and phoning. In one trip, I was headed to Oregon with a teepee. I stopped 10 times to talk to 10 different people to create uh, a check, that because they, they had promised the check would have been mailed a week earlier, but the lady quit and didn't tell anybody. We had contractors waiting to be paid, and uh, the check still wasn't coming, and it took us two weeks later even to get the final check. So there are frustrations, and when you go into a construction phase or even any kind of financing, when you when you were promised money, you make commitments based on that promise, and and then the uh, the fact that people don't have the same priorities you do sometimes is an obstacle. One one of the re one of the ways this, the problem was resolved was the fact that by going through the business center. We had the connections to the loan people, and they had the connections, and they were able to assist us in keeping our credibility with people and by pulling the right strings to wake the right people up. So we finally had the loan. The, the loan, the, the major part of the money was enough to get us open, and we got open in October. And now it's December here, just before Christmas, and we're swamped with orders. So it was all worth it. It's just that it, the frustrations and the, the mechanics of it, and I can see why when you buy a business, blue sky is worth some money because they don't know that frustration to go in to buy a business, the frustration of putting everything together, working out all the bugs, and the time it takes and the connections it takes, and maybe even the lost business it takes to take the time to follow through, to get the loan through and approved. However, it's worth it. We were so busy we couldn't do things. However, we needed things. And one of the things that we needed was our promotional and advertising. The Business Assistance Center in Pablo, the college, not only did they do our brochures, help us lay them out and help us get them printed, they designed a web page. And in the beginning, there wasn't much activity. Probably a good thing because we probably weren't ready for it. But after it was on a year, they readdressed the issue and reposted it. And half of our sales now are web pages. In the last week alone, uh, our web page has generated um, a sale of the TP in Hawaii, and I shipped one to Texas this week. Contacts I never would have had and sales I never would have made without without uh, the internet and the web page. And even by then, once we get the contact, even the brochures. Because some people can read it on a web page, but they want hard copies. And it was all tied together. And, uh, and now we have to go back and, and update that again and include the rest of our business. But overall, it's not just the loan. It's not just the advertising. It's not just the thing. It's the mor morale that these people can back you up. It's, it's frustrating, and there's times where you just want to throw your hands up in the air because it's, you've been told no, and, and then they come along and say, well, you got a good idea. If you still want to do it, let's go, let's go. And uh, I owe it to them. That's, that's that cheerleading, I call it, is, is what got us going and made our dreams possible. As this business has grown, we've met a great number of people, and the TP business is the one we're most firm in because we've had that going now for three full years. And since the web page, we have we've met people that have passed by our shop from Germany, Japan, uh, Canada, Mexico, and a lot of European countries. But with the uh, addition of the uh, web page and the internet, we have made sales in um, we have made some good sales. We've made sales that uh, um, we shipped them to India, uh, which there will be a documentary. I, I'm not going to tell you the whole story on that one because it would take too long. But because of the web page, we were able to contact the lady in England who bought a teepee that we're going to ship to India. They're going to take it to the Himalayas. And, and it's kind of interesting to know that, that you got that client and that uh, they're going to have a product that hopefully will work for them and that, that you're part of a, of a story. And uh, we've had uh, a teacher out of Florida come in and want a three-foot-high teepee for a desk model to tell his 
story to, about Native Americans to the students in his class. And uh, so we've done teepees. Uh, our largest one was, uh, to date has been what they call a 28-foot teepee, which is bigger than the garage we started in. And uh, we sold five of them in, in that one shot. And it was, uh, it's interesting to see who's using these and, and who's not. Our sales have been quite diverse. And I can't tell you what our market is. Uh, we've, we've sold uh, teepees. Uh, we sold one in Nevada, which is a, a, a tree house. The father bought, built his daughter a tree house and put a 12-foot teepee on it. And uh, we've sold, uh, I would say 20 to 25 percent of our sales have been to other tribes, other locations. We, we've sold on the West Coast, East Coast, uh, New Hampshire, uh, Massachusetts, Florida, Arizona. Oh, I'm, I can't remember all of them. But, but we've done a lot of Native Americans have bought them. We've had uh, tourist groups buy them, like uh, camping groups or, or a foundation that would buy some for their employees. And we've had campgrounds. It's, the market is fun because you, you meet a whole different type of people, different groups of people, and you deal in many ways. And as we researched this business, one of our things was through the business plan was to find our competition. And at the time we started, I wasn't that familiar with the web page and uh, internet, but we couldn't find anybody that was making a Native American teepee by tribal members on an Indian reservation and selling them. However, I found that there are a couple that I know of, and there's more competition than I thought there was. However, we had visited three others, three other manufacturers in the Northwest. However, I think that in the United States, we're one of the only ones. The two that I know about are in Canada, and, uh, and I'm sure there's other tribal members doing it. But like I say, we are the ones that right now are the, we're wholly, we're both my wife and I are the partners, are Native American, enrolled members of the Salish Kootenai tribes. We live on the Flathead Indian Reservation in Polson, Montana. And uh, what's so great about this is that uh, we don't sell our local teepee because the cultural needs of, the, of the, our tribe. So we're, uh, we're selling any teepee for anybody and we'll make any style. But we don't commercialize any of them, particularly except for the Sioux which seems to be the, the baseline for the teepee manufacturing business, the Sioux style is most popular. But you're able to, to customize your orders to the customer and, uh, and the painting of them, the artwork, it's all, it's such an individual, personal thing, spiritual sometimes, that it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great business. The, this last year during the construction, of the uh, building in the new shop it was our best year on TP sales. It started early in the year. It was steady. Plus, we were doing more and more upholstery work for some reason. I couldn't say no to people. And uh, my wife and I were both working full-time other jobs. I ended up taking half time off at, at my full-time job and working full-time making teepees. And as the summer progressed, we got busier and busier. We had taken orders and it started to be that um, people were wanting them. And uh, so and within a period of two weeks, I made three road trips just to keep the, the, the customers because I feel the customer service is an important part of our business. I mean, anybody can go to a, a big store and buy a product, but when you have something custom made for a certain need, then I feel that they've chosen you and you should take care of them. And in that week's time, we had uh, three large teepees ordered. One of them was to uh, Fairmont Hot Springs in Canada. One was in Helena, Montana, and the other one was in Bend, Oregon. And, and by then, it was the 4th of July weekend, I believe, or somewhere around the holidays anyway. And I couldn't get these things freighted out and guaranteed to delivery on time. <coughs> Excuse me. So I ended up driving these teepees in their poles and delivering them personally. 
So in that week's time, I spent more time driving than I did sewing. Well, a lot of people have special needs when they order products. And I knew this in the food business. I've known it all my life as a business that sometimes people buy things because they want them and they need them for a certain occasion or a certain time. And, and uh, every one of these jobs, there was a need. One of them was a, a gentleman's 50th birthday party. He had invited all of his relatives to come. The other one was, a, a, um, wasn't as important. Then the other one was a family 50 wedding anniversary for a family gathering in Bend, Oregon. And, uh, and those are special times because people are planning on coming home. There, there's a gift, and uh, there's a special meaning there. And, and, it, and I had promised that I would follow through it. And to me, that was more important than future business. I needed just to get that done to, uh, to fulfill the commitment to those people. The, one of the problems I had in this period of time is that I was making large teepees. And the large teepees, we prefer to, to use a, a heavier weight canvas. It's a 13 ounce canvas. It's good for the customer because it's, it'll, it'll withhold a lot more treatment or uh, abuse or and it'll stay better. Well, the process with that is that it's harder to sew. And as a result, I had a, it, it's slower to, to do the teepee, so your time frame gets off. And then the second thing is, is that physically, it's um, harder to do. And sometimes you can get what they call corporal tunnel in your hands and wrists. And you're pulling sometimes up to 200 pounds of canvas with your wrist, and you're trying to sew it and manipulate it and cut it. So your hands get sore. But it got to the end here where I was delivering the last TP to the 50th wedding anniversary. And uh, my hands were so sore, I couldn't even hold the, drive, the steering wheel to drive. I had to stop two or three times to take naps. I drove all night to get down there. And not only was it to drive after I worked all day finishing this teepee, I had corporal tunnel. I couldn't hang on to the steering wheel. I was driving with my elbows at times just to get down there so I could get this teepee delivered on time. And by the time I got there, I babied myself enough where I could unload the teepee. And I spent the night down there, and it healed better. My next morning, I drove home. But you do what you have to do. And, uh, and I think everybody was happy, and everybody got their teepees. And it seems that as you go through life, when you need something or you want something, if you're not ready for it, you don't get it. Or be careful what you ask for, you might get it. And in this scenario, um, the TP business in this last year is, is, in my mind, in our estimation, estimate, is it was a viable business. It was worth the, the energy. And we'd already started the process to have the shop built. And, and it was pretty much, we were set to, to go on this business. And we had a little problem with the fact that we knew that it was going to be a seasonal business. Uh, but I was gonna, what I was going to do, though, was work year-round at a slower pace and then have a sales period during our peak businesses. So that we could accommodate it, and we figured that with the right operating capital, we could manage this and make a profit. And, and as it grew, devote more and more time to it or expanding. But after we got the building done where people could start seeing the building, we were approached to... Uh, to buy an embroidery business, a custom embroidery business. And um, I, I had interest in it, but because of the upholstery and the sewing, I wasn't afraid of it at all, except that it was, it was time consuming. I mean, I knew it would be a time consuming thing, and I didn't know how to finance it. I'd already been through that game, and, and it's, it's tough getting financing. So after a couple of visits and stuff with the seller, uh, it was a deal that I couldn't turn down. It, was, uh, it offered us a, a cash flow business with accounts receivable and current contracts in progress. And it offered us a year-round business that we didn't have. So I was able to quit my full-time job. Now I'm learning the embroidery business. I love it. it, it the customers are completely different. The atmosphere is different. And uh, 
So that's filling in our time now, which would normally be a slow time, we're swamped. And then on top of that, at the same time, I've been wanting more and more work through the upholstery end of our business. And I picked up another big contract through there because they saw we could do it. We had the room and the facility to do it. So now we have three businesses, which could be any one of them would stand alone into this one location, and, and we've already outgrown it. And it's, uh, and I'm in a process now of uh, hiring people, training them, delegating authority, and that's the hard part, uh, and mastering some of the stuff myself that I don't know. So it's good that it's December. It's good that uh, we did it now, because by the time the summer comes, we'll have a crew, we'll have them trained, and we'll have the facility completely finished and operational and ready for the busy season. Our goal has been to serve the local community. And one of the things we're doing about that is that we're not polluting anything. Everything we do here is a natural thing. We're buying natural canvases, natural threads. I mean, they're synthetic to that point, but some of them are. But we're not tearing down trees except uh, for teepee poles and they're uh, they need to be thin. This lodgepole pine is, is a tree that needs to be thinned anyway. But overall, we're ecology. It's not, we're not hurting the environment. We're creating jobs. And how we're creating jobs is that in the very beginning, we started selling arts and crafts. So we're buying beadwork and local beadwork uh, from our local tribal members and local people. We're, uh, we're, we're making a profit selling it. It helps our cash flow. The, the teepee poles are, are gathered by tribal members, which we're employing in three different sets of uh, crews that, that go out and pick our, our, our poles up. The, um, right now, all the labor is, uh, is uh, local. We haven't hired anybody. Or, I mean, we haven't uh, hired anybody from out of town. And our priority is to employ and educate tribal members. That's our first priority. And, uh, we can't always stay with that because you can't always hire the people that you want. But right now, today, we've been able to to, to hire people that family and uh, people that are, are affiliated with one of the tribes. The embroidery business that we purchased uh, was owned by a tribal member, and uh, so we've kept it. We've kept that business and that employment and. Uh, also, I freed up a job at the tribal government for somebody else to take my old job. So actually, we created another job by just quitting. As I've gone through my life, I had 25 years in business. I had never worked for anybody except the first two years out of the Navy. And uh, it was hard when the poultry business wouldn't pay the bills necessary to live. And now, later in life, as I got these other businesses going, I like working for myself. I meant to be there. I, I work harder probably, but I enjoy it. And uh, the freedom to create your own business or fulfill a dream, in the end, is what, where it is. But you have to have that dream. You, you have to have a target. If you, don't, if you don't zero in on something to get started, it might change. You might uh, not do what you originally started. But if you have a dream and you work with it and you develop it, somewhere you're going to end up probably a better dream than you started with, but you'll have it. So you have to visualize it. And I just visualized. It just took longer to do than I proposed. And as this business develops and the dreams go, and as I develop it, I would like to, uh, to get it smoothed out, all the bugs worked out, and be able to have more time to myself now. The business is there. It's training people. I would like to travel and do some of the sales myself and see some more of the country. I'd like to get, interact more with the people that we're dealing with. And, and it seems that that's getting easier and easier to do. But there's a lot of marketing things that I want to play with that I haven't. I'm worried about a needle breaking or a thread breaking instead of a, uh, learning something new. So I would like to be able to get trained and then get somebody trained and then learn some more so I can train them some more. It never ends. I've had seven professions in my life, all because of businesses that I bought. And, and I've never, everyone's different, and there's always constant training and updating.
The biggest thing <clears throat> that I think in planning anything you do is like you have a dream. But be realistic. Uh, it's not for everybody. Some people just can't do the hours, the frustrations and stuff, because the frustrations come. There's nobody to turn to. When you're the boss, you're the boss. The toilet plugs, you fix it. It's, it's not the, uh, it's, it's not all glory. It's not all sitting there writing checks and buying new cars. You have to uh, work long hours. You have to be able to, to have rejection. Not every sales approach you make is gonna work. The, the negatives are there, like every job. But the rewards are there too. And uh, this is my retirement. This is what I'm using as my retirement. And I will get that. It's on its way. And without some help, again, I, I had good people behind me. And, and I would say that if you get the right people working with you and understanding your goals, like the college is my crutch. And, and I still use them. I just, I get called from them. There's a seminars coming up, there's training, there's uh, activities to help other people do this. And that's what I want to do. That's one of my goals is to help them make their job easier. Because economic development in this area on, on Indian reservations is still struggling. And it's hard to get capitalization it's hard to, to get your dream out there. And somebody that doesn't understand the spirituality of, of, of the life here has a hard time understanding your goals and what you're trying to accomplish. Like I say, the local bankers are here. One of them has been here since 1901. Doesn't understand that people do live in teepees. And nobody buys them, they said. Yet last year I was busy all summer for nobody buying them. And, and those are the frustrations you run into. So. You have to be prepared for frustrations, and there are those that won't be able to succeed. But if your goal is strong enough, and if you know what you want to do, and you have some help and some, some guidance and support, you'll do it.